What's the one app on your phone you can't live without? I'd say Snapchat. Snapchat's my favorite platform. I get 20 million views every day. Wow. The next kind of core social media platform is going to really emphasize the aspect of parasocial community aspect. With Daisy Pay, you're helping micro and nano creators tap into new revenue streams through branded content. And how do you see this changing the game for smaller creators? Daisy is allowing creators to make money by not posting content, which is the most counterintuitive thing. Brands come to us because they see this as very organic paid media rather than going through Spark Ads or Facebook Ads Manager and paying more money for the same result. So we can be able to leverage creators and the impact of a collective following. Well, that's so impactful because that's additional money that creators can make just by having a following. You said in your TED talk that social media saved your life. What did you mean by that? There's a lot of conversation about social media having a negative impact on the world. But for me, I had a very positive reason to be on social media. I was getting bullied outside of social media and I was able to turn to social media to really find my community and my belonging. I was able to interact with others in a way that I wasn't able to outside of the digital landscape. Hello everyone, this is Shubham Tiwari. I'm the head of content marketing and social chat fellow, the universal API for creator data. And I welcome you all to the second season of Impulse, Google's number one rated podcast on influencer marketing. We recently passed 50,000 subscribers. So thank you so much, each and every one of you for making it happen. I'm truly, truly grateful for the support. And to celebrate this milestone today, we have none other than Rodin Flash with us. Love it. Thank you so much. This is not a secret. They can see your name on the screen. So yes. Dylan Huey, welcome to the Impulse Season 2. Uh, we are really excited to have you here to give a further you know, introduction to our audience. Dylan Huey is the founder and CEO of Reach, a premier organization for creators and influencers. He has also been really active in the past uh, from giving a you know, powerful TED talk to how social media saved his life to launching multiple startups, including his latest venture Reach, which I just told you about. Dylan is a musician and a content creator with over 6 million followers across social media, 4 million on TikTok. Dylan's passion for innovation and community shines through everything Thing he does so far he has created a clothing line which is called dream big a social media talent agency chalk network and an augmented reality design studio called snap lens and of course as i said at the beginning as a rodin flash he has also recorded a label dylan uh welcome again to impulse thank you thank you for having me i'm excited to be here and you know really excited to share my insights i've been in the social media space since i was 15 years old so I've been doing it for a long time. I'm 22 now. So um, I've definitely seen a lot of things and had a lot of experiences, whether it be me as a creator, me on the brand side, or even running my own marketing agency. Right. And for the record, Dylan is just 22 right now, and he's already made a significant impact in the creator economy. So we are going to pick his brain about creator economy and his journey we are going to focus on. So let's start on a fun note. Yeah. If you could create a social media platform with a single unique feature, that no other platform has, what would it be and why? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think that a lot of the platforms on social media now, you have like TikTok, you have Instagram, YouTube, a lot of them are really the same platform just with something that makes them very different, right? They all have a short form component now. They're all emphasizing long form. There's some stories element, right? Snapchat, its main core is stories, but then you have Instagram stories, you have TikTok stories now. So I think what really, you know, the next kind of core in, uh, social media platform is going to really emphasize the aspect of community. And I think the parasocial community aspect, especially when it comes to your micro communities that you are in, your friend groups, right? I think those are really the impact drivers of today. So I think that there's going to be a social media platform that really emphasizes that aspect of your micro communities. iMessages is so, so, so huge. And I love iMessages group chats personally but i think having a social media uh, platform that really leverages and drives these kind of more micro communities i know if i you know have 32 of my best friends and an iMessage group chat i'm gonna have a better uh, margin and roi of getting my friends to be able to purchase a product or uh, to go watch this new movie rather than you know a thousand people who i don't know so i think there's gonna right. be something driven where it's really focused on your friend communities and those smaller communities and affinity groups. Right. 
So I sort of have the idea now what kind of apps you use and passionate about. You're very community centric. You're passionate about uh, helping people. What's the one app on your phone you can't live without? That's good Other question. than you know, yeah, yeah. I'd say I'd say Snapchat. Snapchat's my favorite platform. I get 20 million views every day on Snapchat, and I think wow. that for me as a creator, um, what really sticks out is the fact that on Snapchat, my content disappears after 24 hours i can make content that really resonates with other people um and it's also very authentic right it doesn't stay it's really day in my life and for me as a creator it doesn't make me feel like i'm taking an extra 30 minutes out of my day to learn a new tiktok dance right it's really showcasing my life and like who i am so i think snapchat for me has been an amazing platform one to kind of cre- create an authentic audience but then two to really interact with my friend in a more personable way right makes sense so i'm not a very big snapchat guy but of course i see the usage and the, the utility behind snapchat describe your perfect day you know in one sentence yeah i mean my day for the last few years have been non-stop working on building up reach and my own social media platform and i think that what I really love is my job and the career that I'm in, the space that I'm in. I've had like two years being in the social media space where I got so burnt out, but, and I wouldn't be doing uh, social media and content if I didn't really love my job. So honestly, a perfect day is what I'm doing now, like living and going to these amazing events in Los Angeles, being able to share my experiences with my audience and my my platform and really making an impact in other brands um, and other creators. So that, I mean, that's a perfect day for me. Uh, I don't need to go to the beach to, to enjoy my uh, my day. We see your name, uh, Rodin Flash, uh, in the, you know, backdrop. So yeah. uh, related to that, if you had to choose a theme song for your life right now, what would it be? That's a good question. Let me give you a background. Reach started off as a student organization at USC. Um, And being a student organization, we had a recruitment cycle every single semester. And we would have 500 kids at USC apply to join our club every semester. And we had a three round recruitment cycle. And we'd only accept like 30, 20 people because we want to make this a very family oriented, personable club and not accept like 500 people where we don't know all 500 people. So the second round of our recruitment cycle has always been a one-on-one interview Um, where one uh, executive board member interviews one applicant. And a question that I really love that goes right on the same same voice as what you just asked is for me, I would ask everyone, what song uh, describes your life um, and why? Um, If you could pick one song. Um, I think that that kind of tees up everything. For me, my go-to answers, I'm going to give you two. My go-to answers were Mm -hmm. Pursuit of Happiness, by Kid Cudi. I think, you know, I always just, you know, enjoy being happy and enjoy kind of what I'm doing. Cause like I said, if I didn't love doing what I was doing, I wouldn't be doing it. And then uh, the second song is Million Dreams by uh, The Greatest Showman. The movie's amazing. I love the movie, but I think the uh, whole message of the, of the, the song, having a ton of different dreams and goals and aspirations really hits for me what I, you know, what I have in my, in my mind for myself. So those are the two songs I would pick. Wonderful. I'll, I'll surely give them a listen after this interview. You talked about reach. Uh, so your content, uh, first of all, uh, you know, it leaves a positive, inspiring impression on people. And you wrote a wonderful story on LinkedIn about it, like how a mother came to you and talked about how you are impacting her daughter's life. So mm-hmm. can you can you tell us uh, about that story? What was it? And yeah, give the yeah. experience yeah. to our listeners as well. Totally. Like I said, I've been doing social media since I was 15 years old. And when I started off in social media, I was on a platform called Musical.ly, which was a little lip syncing platform. And I obviously, before I joined uh, Musical.ly, I didn't have any social media. So I was under the impression that everyone was making content. Um, So I joined the platform, knowing nothing about content, started making content. Um, And in the first week, I gained 30,000 followers. Um, wow. And, okay. Yeah. And I didn't have any, any social media. I didn't know what a following meant or having an audience. I assumed that everyone had an audience in some capacity. Um, but what I did was I was live streaming every single day and I was live streaming for about five hours a day. 
Um, and for me, it was really showing other people that there's others who relate to them. I was getting bullied in middle school and I really wanted to build my audience to really inspire others and really show them that there's others out there who can relate to them. Um, so that was really what my content was and you know what drove me to be successful on social media was that I was the only one talking about mental health, about getting bullied, about you know vulnerability, where everyone else was kind of making musically uh, lip syncing videos. Um, so my content was very vastly different, but it was great because I was getting about 30,000 viewers at one time when I was live streaming and, you know, a million plus likes per live stream, which is great and incredible numbers. For me, it didn't really put a perspective of this is the actual impact that I'm making. I didn't realize, oh, 30,000 people is 30,000 people. And that was huge. And my 15 year old self was so naive into being like, you know, it's just people and probably just bought people who you know, really don't care about um, what the things I was doing was. So, I mean, the content that I was doing when I was live streaming was anything from like reading Shakespeare in my uh, freshman high school uh, English class to uh, having people go live with me, teaching me French for an hour. Like those are the types of live streams I was doing. And it was very, very centered around how can I interact with other people? How can I make sure that, uh, you know, people felt heard and understood? Um, so when I was 16, I started going on different influencer tours um, and doing different meet and greets. And this one, I mean, all of the interactions that I had were incredible and super impactful because people were coming to these concerts and tours to see me. And I was like, that is so, so, so crazy. But then, you know, my mom, after this one show in San Francisco that we did, was like, this mother came up to me and gave me a hug and said, thank you for uh, inspiring and saving my child. That was super impactful. She said that her daughter was suicidal and wasn't in a good place, but my live streams that I made really, you know, saved her daughter. Um, and I think that that, you know, that impact right there, that alone really shows the influence that social media can have. Yeah, totally. It's quite moving actually. And you also said in, in your TED talk that social media saved your life, right? Yeah. What did you mean by that? Yeah. I mean, I, like I said, I was getting bullied and for me, I didn't have anyone to turn to. So I, I think there's a lot of conversation about social media having a negative impact on the world being, you know, a lot of cyberbullying and a lot of underage exploitation and yeah. all these different aspects that come with the negative effects of social media. But for me, I have had a very positive and reason to be on social media you know i was getting bullied outside of social media and you know in middle school and high school yeah and i was able to turn to social media to really find my community and my belonging and i think that that's where the impact of social media really came for me was that i was able to interact with others um, in a way that i wasn't able to outside of uh, the digital landscape right and can you tell us about reach, uh, more about reach? Where is it right now? How many users are there and how are you growing it? Yeah, so reach started off as a student organization. It started in, uh, at USC and in the last 19 months or so, we've expanded it from one university at USC to now 75 universities. So wow. it's the first and only social media influencer content creator organization at different universities. We have about 2,500 members nationwide. Uh, okay. That's 500 million plus followers amongst all 2,500 of our members. We have some pretty significant alums in our organization as well. Alan Chicken Chow, who's the most watched YouTube shorts creator in the world. He was a Forbes top 50 creator, Forbes 330 this year. We have Mark Young Benhamu, who was actually the founder of the USC chapter. He started a content group called Smile Squad, uh, Party Shirt, 20 million followers. So we've had incredible members and alums join our organization, um, which has been amazing. So really started off as a student organization, still is a student organization across these 75 universities. We're on track to, to continue growing in more and more universities where not too many universities really teach about the influencer space. So we try to be that solution and kind of create an environment for these influencers to be able to come together, learn from, learn from each other, collaborate with each other and really grow, uh, which has been incredible. But then beyond that, we've grown it out even larger. So we now have, in addition, a marketing agency. We have a talent division. We have a ventures division where we have equity in a ton of different tech and creator economy startups. And we have a, a studio division where we're currently in post-production on a short film right now. So um, we've grown it out much larger. 
Um, but I, I mean, at the core, we've really been focused on community. Wonderful. That's a wonderful community you have of, and you're influencing, you know, so many people through this community. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank uh, you. And coming from, you know, Silicon Valley, you've already founded multiple startups, which I you know, yeah. told people at the very beginning. <laughs> uh, so what are your top three business lessons have you drawn from working with these influencers and, you know, starting these uh, startups? That's a great question. I think there's a, there's a few things here. I think first and foremost, it's all about confidence, right? Confidence is your biggest asset. Um, I think it's important to be the expert in your field and if you're not the expert, you're always a learner, right? So um, you're always every day going to be learning something new. And it's important to really be an expert in whatever the industry that you're in uh, and really master that, um, especially when it comes from me, like working with different creators. A lot of creators are always coming to me for support on negotiations and brand deal pricing and reading contracts and all that stuff. Because when I started social media myself in 2016, my biggest asset was I was never someone who was just going to sit down and wait for brands to come to me, especially 2016 where influencer marketing really wasn't a budget in these uh, brands budgets. I had to show these brands why I was an asset to them and where they could find ROI by working with me rather than a traditional celebrity. So we would have, you know, nowadays creators coming to me being like, Hey, you know, how can I price out my rate or even campaigns that we're doing on the marketing agency side, I'll have creators coming to me saying, hey, I don't know what to price this for a campaign that you're doing. And I'll be honest with them. I'll be like, this is how much the creator uh, should price it um, because you know I want to make sure that everyone is kind of winning and succeeding at the end of the day. So that's the first thing. Confidence is your biggest asset. Second, I think communication is so, so, so key. Um, I try to kind of play under the assumption that if I don't tell someone what to do or how to do it, it's not going to get done the way that I want it to get done. So it's always about educating others, being the teacher, always being the learner, like I said, in the first side, but also always being that teacher, uh, you know, whether it be, you know, for a brand deal, making sure that the creator has the right information, um, has the do's, has the don'ts, because if you don't put something there, then, you know, there's a chance that they're going to do it. So always making sure that the creator, the talent manager, the brand, everyone has everything that they need to be successful. Um, then third, I've always been about building your own lane and kind of figuring out what your strengths and your weaknesses are and playing to your strengths, whether that be you know, as an agency owner or a creator. I always tell people uh, if they're a content creator, really find what makes you different because at the end of the day, there's over 39,000 people on TikTok with over a million followers, right? If there's over 39,000 people with over a million followers on TikTok, what's going to get someone to watch you over someone else, right? If you're making the same right. exact content, you know, what's going to make you different. So figure out why people can't re replicate you and make yourself indispensable in the space that you're in. Right. Wonderful uh, confidence, communication, and finding your own niche. Can, can I use the word niche? Yeah. I like to say like building your own lane, but also finding your yeah. own niche, and whether it be as a creator or as a, as a brand itself. Right. Got it. Wonderful points for any creator who might be listening to this right now. Uh, Dylan, with Daisy Pay, you're helping micro and nano creators tap into new revenue streams through branded content. So cool. what sparked the idea and how do you see this changing the game for smaller creators? Yeah. So at its core, Daisy is allowing creators to make money by not posting content, which is the most counterintuitive thing for creators. But you can make $20 by liking and commenting on another creator's post. Or you can make $150 by reposting an IG story, which is incredible given that it takes 10 seconds of work to be able to do that, right? So on, on Daisy, brands come to us um, because they see this as very organic paid media rather than you know going through Spark Ads or Facebook Ads Manager and paying yeah. you know, even more money for the same result. So we can be able to leverage creators and the impact of a collective following to be able to get that same amplification and the same boosting. And, but in the same time, this is incredible for creators because now they can make money doing so. And I know a lot of creators, because I used to do this myself, be in a lot of engagement group chats on Instagram, on TikTok, on Snapchat, so that creators can be able to like and comment on each other's content 
so that it can boost the algorithm, right? So that is something that creators have been doing for for years. Um, I've been doing that since I was 15 years old. Whenever I'd post on Instagram, I'd send it out to every single engagement group chat and be like, hey guys, can you like and comment on it so that I can get some support? Um, but now being able to pay creators to do that is so, so, so impactful, especially creators who aren't making that much money because 50% right. of creators are making less than $500 a month. Now, if we can be able to help them double that by doing three or four repost campaigns that Daisy has a month, well, that's so impactful because that's additional money that creators can make just by having a following. Wonderful. And I must say that you're really, really good at, you know, giving names to these, you know, brands like Dream Big, Chalk Network, Daisy Thank Pay. You. Thank it's amazing, you. like full of vibe and positivity. And you feel like, you know, it's very accessible. It's not something totally. very exclusive. Totally. Right? I don't, I don't like naming companies with something that is, doesn't make sense. But as well, yeah. like a word that people don't understand or know. Uh, for example, reach. If you think about reach, it's all about amplification yep. and reaching, you know, new followers and growth. Um, Daisy, at the core of Daisy, it's our Daisy chains, getting creators to be able to create that chain amplification effect. Um, so that's really kind of what we've really strived, at least on my side, is make sure that creators and individuals really understand who we are and what our company is. Adilin, uh, mental health is a crucial topic you speak about. Uh, so how do you personally manage the pressure of being in the public eye and managing so many businesses right now? And what advice do you have for you know others to navigate you know through these challenges? Yeah, I think there's a few things. I think it's one, finding a balance between public and private. I think that's always important, especially when I go outside because I do have a follower on social media and people know who I am. It gets tricky to um, kind of make sure that you're conscientious about, uh, you know, who says what and, you know, the things that are there because anxiety about kind of your, your background. But I really try to, you know, figure out times where it's, you know, all about, um, you know, my work and you know, what I'm doing job wise. I mean, right after this, I'm going to go four hours film uh, some content with, uh, with my team. But then, you know, at the end of the day, you know, hanging out with friends. You know, I don't, I don't like talking about social media that much um, because that's not the time, you know, it's 10 PM. I don't yep. want to be talking about what new TikTok trends we're trying to film content <laughs> for. Um, so I think that's super huge, but I think as well, it's figuring out hobbies. I really love tennis. Um, I'm excited oh, to be going to the U S open next week. So I'm going to be watching. Oh, some wow. tennis. It'll be fun. Um, but I've been playing tennis since I was five years old. So that's something that I love doing two to three times. Nice. Week, nice. I love going to the gym. Um, so, you know, finding those things that are very relaxing for you are super important. Who's your greatest, you know, or all time favorite tennis player? Ooh, all time favorite tennis player. That's a good question. I would say this sounds so cliche, Roger Federer. Um, I, uh -oh. I, I love people who are, who are the best in their spaces. And he's obviously, you know, when it comes to tennis, the goat, I'd say, you know, beyond that, um, Yannick Noah is amazing. Serena Williams, Venus Williams are incredible. There's so many, yep. and right now there's so many amazing, so many amazing killer tennis players who are so young that it's unbelievable. Uh, Wimbledon has been going crazy. Yeah, I mean, the tide is turning and we are seeing newer players taking the, you know, the Grand Slams. Oh, uh, wow. Speaking of newer players, IQ. Uh, <laughs> Uh, with, you know, Reach and your other startups, what do you see as the future of creator economy? And how do you see uh, technology and social media will continue to evolve or shape into what kind of influencer marketing? I, I understand the community will be a very bigger piece of the puzzle, but what else do you see coming in? It's interesting because I think technology and social media are always starting to merge, right? I think we are starting to see an amazing emergence between technology where technology was kind of its own lane and social media was its own lane, but now they're overlapping. I mean, it starts off off the bat with a big kind of keyword AI. AI is so huge and um, yep. 
I think every social media company is, and every app is starting to find ways that they can tie in AI, which has been incredible. And I think that's a game changer for creators. And I don't think that there's ever going to be a time where AI takes over the social media landscape. But I think AI can be a paintbrush in the toolkit where social media influencers can be able to leverage AI to be able to help them be more productive and more creative and really democratize the space where, I mean, there's a lot of different things like uh, editing and videography, et cetera, which takes a lot of time, but it makes it a lot easier with AI for creators to be able to execute those faster. Because so I think that's kind of one big thing. Um, but I, I, like I said, I think the emergence between social media and technology is really where we're seeing it. I mean, if you take a look at Meta right now with MetaQuest, uh, you know, that's a uh, VR is a very technology focused thing. But they're they're finding ways to integrate social media with it. So VR, AR, AI, all of those three kind of in combination with each other are really creating an impact that shows that social media is starting to become intertwined with the entire economy as a whole. Wonderful. So in this, you know, uh, immediate future where everything is, you know, converging from AI to influencers, influencer marketing, how do you see, you know, fellow like tools, like API tools, uh, yeah. helping you at Reach or Daisy Pay or any other ventures? Where do you see players like us fitting into your plan? I mean, at the end of the day, I think the thing that resonates for a lot of brands and a lot of tech companies is data. And I think that the core, that's what Philo is really focused on is data for creators, for brands to be able to build reports because at the end of the day, creators and brands, you know, they all want data and they want to own their data and they want to know what their data is. And at least for brands, you know, working with creators, they want to know if a creator really makes sense. So especially when it comes to Philo and the tools that Philo has, as an agency or as a creator, I can be able to come to a brand and be like, this is my analytics. This is my last brand deal. This is what we're able to generate. So it gives more insight for creators to be able to own their audience. Great. I mean, yeah, the future is really exciting. We're all coming together. That's why we call it, you know, creator economy. All the players are empowering each other. So Dylan, uh, you are an eager learner. As we know about you at 22, yeah, you have, you know, so much of knowledge. You are literally a veteran of creator economy. Thank you. Uh, I don't I mean, I'm not that old to be a veteran, <laughs> but I appreciate it. You're so different because you have proved yourself as a creator as well, right? You have yeah. such large following on TikTok and uh, then you have your businesses as well. Totally. So what's something exciting that you're learning nowadays? What are you, you know, in anything uh, being from a guitarist to anything? It's a good question. I mean, I've been playing guitar since I was 11. So <laughs> yeah, that was like, uh, of course, you have your record label, label. So yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a good question. I, I think a lot of what I've been learning nowadays are always really subtle. I'm always reading. I'm always educating myself on new topics, especially when it comes to like organization and infrastructure and kind of how to scale businesses more successfully. Because someone like me, I'm never kind of I never love being stagnant. And I never love being complacent. And I always try to find what more can I be doing? What more can Reach be doing? And how can we continue to grow? I mean, if we're thinking about things that I've learned tangibly, I've been going through like a deep scroll on TikTok. I don't know if you ever do this, but I've been going through a deep scroll on TikTok. Sometimes there's videos that give like random fun facts or like random educational videos like about whales or like random animals like cheetahs. Um, those are always super fun, but um, kind of a, a more tangible thing. I mean, I think it's always just the subtle things like how can I be more timely? How can I you know, make sure I delegate more? Um, right. Those very subtle things that are so important to make a company successful. Those are the things that I'm always constantly learning. How can I be a better entrepreneur um, day in and day out? Wonderful. So looking ahead, what's a big dream or, or project that you haven't tackled yet? but are excited to explore in the future. Yeah, there's a lot. I mean, uh, at our division, we're always always doing stuff over here at Reach. (laughs) At our talent division, we are continuing to assign more and more talent, which is incredible. Um, So we're continuing to grow out our talent division. We're about to launch our Reach Ventures division. We have equity, like I said, in a ton of different startups, but we're gonna do something cool, uh, an incubator um, to really help startups, especially startups that want to leverage creators, uh, help them scale in a more successful way. So that's something that's in the works for the next few months that we're really, really excited to announce very soon. Yeah, really building that tool set for companies 
to be successful in today's economy, especially in a digital first economy. Beyond that, I mean, we're continuing to do a lot of amazing things on our on our reach uh, nationals nonprofit side, the student organization side. We have 15 amazing uh, national industry advisory board members, you know, individuals from Meta, from Snapchat, from Viral Nation, um, from some of the top companies in the creator space. And we're going to be building out a fall mentorship program, which is going to be incredible because I know our students at our different universities want to be able to turn to those uh, those mentors um, just to network, to be able to have an in in, uh, in the, the corporate space and to be able to learn what skill sets that they need to be successful, especially given that there's only 15 to 20 universities that teach about influencer marketing. So, you know, we're, we're going to continue building up that pipeline where our students can learn from the best of the best who are in this industry. Right. Wonderful. Naval Ravikant uh, says that, you know, networking is overrated. You should, you know, work so well that network comes to you. Do you agree with that? I mean, hey, <laughs> we, uh, we've spent, I've spent a good few years um, building my network and outreaching to a lot of yeah. people and pitching myself and why I'm valuable. And nowadays I, I do have people who, uh, who come to me and it's incredible to see that transition because now we're seeing a lot of people say, oh, you know, I know about reach or, you know, I know about the UCLA chapter. I know about the USC chapter. Uh, and, and reaching out to me. And that's incredible to see. And I, I think that's really the direction that I want to see is, you know, I don't want people to know Reach for being a company that I started. I want people to come to Reach really enthusiastic because of the reputation of the, of the company that we're building. Um, so yeah. it's always incredible when we can change that landscape rather than me having to teach people what Reach is and be like, oh yeah, we have all these different things that we're doing and we have a nonprofit side and we have a for-profit side. But, you know, when people really say, oh, I know about reach, I know the impact that they're, they're making on higher education. That for me, you know, makes my day. And it's incredible to hear the impact that we have on the creator space. Yeah. And I've always looked at that quote by Naval Ravikant as sort of a hot take, not exactly, let's say a truth or a piece of truth. Totally. Uh, but yeah, a couple of last rituals that we make our guests go through, Dylan. Uh, yes. You have to tell us your, you know, favorite book or whatever you're reading right now. And you have to, you know, uh, recommend or nominate someone for our show. I'm reading 48 Laws of Power right now. Um, oh, Robert Greene. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big one. Um, so that one's the one I'm reading right now. What's the second question that you asked? Uh, would you like to nominate any, you know, influencer from your, let's say, reach uh, community for us? Yeah, yeah. I mean, my fav one of my favorite influencers um my mom loves her emmy renner um she made okay. a company called sophisticated spreads and they they work with every single um a-list celebrity um wow. on charcuterie board so they're a charcuterie board business my mom loves her emmy is a ust student incredible she scaled into a six-figure business so fast and such a hustler so She's always the one that I love. I love recommending to people because um, amazing, amazing girl. Wonderful. We'll certainly try to, you know, get her on this show. Uh, cool. Dylan, thank you so much uh, for coming to the show and whatever you're doing to support the creator economy from, you know, right from nano influencers to, you know, the biggest influencers you are in, you know, you are in tune with everyone. So thank you have you. the bird, bird's eye view. We wish you the best with all the ventures that you're involved in. And... Uh, yeah, let's, you know, hope to do this again with you when you have like 50 million subscribers soon <laughs> on TikTok, at least. So thanks again. If you thought uh, you liked a particular bit from this interview, please let us know. Uh, you can follow Dylan on, you know, any of your favorite platforms. Uh, check out, you know, Reach. And yeah, do let us know what you thought of this episode. Thank you so much for watching. Amazing. Thanks, guys. Impulse, the influencer marketing podcast is brought to you by Philo. Philo is the easiest way to get access to authenticated creator data from hundreds of different platforms. To know more about Philo, visit getphilo.com. That's get p h y l l o dot com. Also, make sure to search for influencer marketing podcast in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or any of your favorite podcast listing platforms. And don't forget to click subscribe so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Philo, thank you so much for listening.